Uh, all right, so many thanks to our speakers and, and Tim's last comments remind us of kind of where we started this morning, which is the idea here is not simply to educate, which our panelists have done a lovely job of doing in a really complicated topic uh, that involves all of the institutions, right? As we heard, it's a, a back and forth between voters who put people in and then the legislators themselves and perhaps some commissions and then some courts and it's a very complicated process. Um, but that part of that process is actually discussing what the options might be um, and asking questions and kind of learning about what those options might be. Um, and so with that, uh, we'll open it up to questions. Uh, all right, so I've already received a couple, so I'm going to start with those. Uh, all right, so the first question is, uh, long, <laughs> Kelly's giggling because she wrote it, uh, but I'm going to translate for her as I do get where she's going with this. So um, she said, we've talked a lot today about uh, fair representation in terms of partisanship, um, but to what extent can, do you think redistricting can be used to promote fairer, more representative legislatures in other terms. So for instance, in terms of race or in terms of gender, uh, how could the redistricting process make legislatures fairer in other ways as well? Um, the, the one thing that I would say, I, I think, uh, you know, race is uniquely protected by the Voting Rights Act and so it becomes a part, it's a, it's a very integral part of um, the redistricting conversation every 10 years um, and and party is as well because it's because people tend to live um, you know in partisan communities some places are more partisan than others um, and so it's easy to draw a line easier to draw lines to reflect that um, I think gender is harder because every place has um, lots of both men and women uh, the one way I, I would think that you could actually promote um, more women in office through uh, through redistricting is um, th you know not necessarily through a commission but but how whatever your mechanism is to just radically redraw the lines um, because it uh, it really shakes up incumbency and forces incumbents to run against um, a lot of newcomers and that certainly happened in California we had a lot of turnover. Uh, after the the new new lines went in place, um, and uh, and a lot of uh, a lot of people who um, were running in very unfamiliar territory, and it hurt them, um, quite honestly. And I think that 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 encourages new people to get involved. Uh, so, but that, uh, that's the way that I would think that some, not just gender, but some other things that don't have a sort of geographic element to them, um, you might promote more representation from those sorts of communities. Uh, I've, single member districts are really bad for trying to uh, equally represent gender. L I agree with Eric that we do a reasonably good job with race, um, although the court has also been specific that you know, by you know, requiring the drawing of majority minority districts, we're not requiring proportionality, which I thought was kind of weird. You know? So what, what are you requiring? Um, you know, so it's something less than proportional amount of seats for minorities. Um, and other countries, so the Western countries, America, Canada, uh, Great Britain, and Australia with that all use, that use single member district systems, although the other four, three countries use parliamentary systems. Um, well, women's representation is really bad, whereas in proportional systems, you could have quotas, you could have reserved seats, there's lots of you know, direct, straightforward mechanisms. Um, and so since, we're so since the parties matter so little, here, you know, it's not like the Republican Party can say, well, we're going to have 50% of our candidates be women. That's just kind of impossible to do in, in the single member district system. So I think we'd need, we'd need a completely different system. Anyone else like to weigh in? Okay. Uh, all right. So this is a two parter. Uh, but the parts aren't particularly related. But there are things that, that many of you brought up today. Um, one question is something that Mike raised, which is, is there a reason that the Constitution calls for actual enumeration rather than having some kind of, of survey mechanism for, ca for counting population? Um, and then sort of a question joke, but it's actually quite relevant uh, to something that Tom said, which is maybe Pennsylvania should forcibly relocate their Democrats uh, to make sure that that could actually 
work to sort of balance the idea of the, the state's partisanship with the drawing of districts. Um, so either of those questions could be open to anyone. <laughs> Maybe I'll try to address the first uh, question, you know, why, why do we have to actually count? And I think when they were writing this part of the Constitution, they didn't think about doing a survey, right? So this was at the Constitutional Convention. There's actually a lot of debate over the size of the districts. Um, and it was, uh, it's George Washington's basically only contribution to the Constitution was the size of the districts to be, I think, about 33,000 inhabitants. Um, but I think it was really, you know, no one envisioned at the convention doing a survey and, you know, the mathematics around that, how it would be more accurate. I think the Democrats, uh, I'm trying to remember which, which time they did this, they actually proposed to do it via um, an estimation, but the court said it was not allowed. Um, so, yeah, I don't think there was specific, you know, like, well, we need to go down this path and not the other, just it was the times. And the census originally was used to, to, for taxing purposes, too. We didn't have a federal income tax until the 20th century, so it had this dual purpose of apportioning the House of Representatives, but also for apportioning how much tax each state was going to, to, uh, to owe the federal government. And so that was nice because they kind of balance each other, right? I mean, paying taxes is a negative, but getting more seats in the House is a positive, so it kind of had this nice balance. But once we started the federal income tax, that was no longer... Um, uh, part of, no longer part of the, the purpose of the census. And then with the, with the, of course, you know, back then they didn't have survey techniques, you know, at all. Um, so they couldn't imagine actual enumeration, I think made perfect sense uh, at the time. And then, but the problem with the, uh, this actually, in the 1990s, the Democrats and the Clinton administration wanted to adjust the census using statistical methods. But the, I mean, the way, the, what we would have ended up with was, is actually no better than the census itself, and it could have been worse depending on how badly the survey was done. So what they were going to do was they were still going to try to count everybody, and then they were going to do a secondary smaller census that was going to be really accurate, right? And then they were going to compare the really accurate small census to the, to the larger clunkier not so accurate census and then make adjustments based on this. And so, um, and this is a reasonably valid technique. It's called capture recapture. It's how you estimate the number of fish in a pond, the number of bats in the cave, stuff like this. But it wasn't. It's not perfect. Um, and I think there would have been a lot of political problems from it as well. So um, I don't know if the survey is the best answer either. Um, uh, just a couple of thoughts. One is that uh, the, the census actually does use surveys for a lot of the questions, right? Not most. Most people don't get the full length the long form census survey, they get the shorter one that just says, are you here, basically. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, there is some survey methodology has, has crept into the census, but I agree, it's not something that's a part of the central count that, that we use for the districts. And then as for Pennsylvania, um, Trail of Tears uh, suggestion, um, <laughs> I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, short of moving people forcibly, uh, um, one possibility is to draw the districts very aggressively to split up those Democratic strongholds. So um, part of what makes things hard for Democrats, not just the, the partisan gerrymandering, it's also that Democrats tend to be concentrated in these central cities. Um, that means they, they run up the, the numbers in a handful of districts, win those districts by very large margins. Um, when all they needed was to win a seat by 50% plus one. Uh, and so you could take all of those extra supporters, theoretically, and move them to other districts, and they could become supporters in those districts and help Democrats win those as well. Um, that doesn't happen as much with Republicans because Republicans tend to live in rural areas and are more um, spread out. Uh, so what they did in Illinois, Illinois, I think everybody agrees in the last cycle, was a partisan gerrymander. However, in terms of the partisan, this, this question of sort of partisan distribution and, and sizes of majorities in districts, it's actually a pretty fair plan. Um, and it's because the Democrats sent these uh, sort of spears into Chicago, you know, and, and just picked out some little chunks of Democratic supporters from, from the heavily Democratic areas and connected them to supporters out further in rural areas and thereby um, you know, mollified this uh, distortion that, that happens just because of the nature of political geography. I, I should add on this point uh, about sort of having these very heavily Democratic districts. It's not necessarily the Republicans saying, oh, we're going to put all these Democrats in here and we're going to take advantage. Um, a lot of the Democrats who, who rep Democrats who represent those districts are very happy, right? If you're a member of Congress and like, look, you're going to get 75% of the vote every time, you're going to fight for that plan, right? You're, you're, it's harder to find the member who says, you know what, put me at 55%, it's fine. 
Um, and so, you know, you mentioned the Florida case where the, the district that, you know, might be changed, the representative suing, uh, saying, you know, it's not fair to me. Um, there's a case in, I think I have this right, in Virginia where th there's a lawsuit against it. Uh, and one of the questions is standing because no one from the district is part of the lawsuit. It's people who are outside of the district. <laughs> Um, now, it gets a little complicated because if you change the lines, they may then be in the district because anytime you change one district, you, ha you by definition have to change at least one other, if not a number of other uh, districts. So that's one reason why it's so complicated is you can't just change one thing and everything's, you know, the solution presents itself. So I'm going to follow up on something that, that comes out in some of these questions as well that you guys have alluded to. Uh, which is the, the ideal size of a congressional district particularly. Of course, it'll vary for state legislatures depending on the state population. But for Congress, you know, as Mike mentioned, the, the George Washington numbers are largely what they started with, the four, think 30 or 40,000 um, in the Constitution originally, and now they are well over 700,000, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So given that, um, what is your ideal size of district and, you know, what would that involve in, in changing the U.S.? So my, my ideal size of district probably is inversely proportional, in, inversely related to how big I think the legislature should be. So this is difficult, right? Uh, probably a smaller district, you probably get better representation, maybe more access to your member. Uh, so in New Hampshire, in the legislature, I don't know the exact number, but it's well over 400 representatives in the legislature in New Hampshire. Uh, with only two members of Congress, right? So it's a pretty small state, lot, very small uh, house districts. But as you decrease the size of the uh, district, you increase the size of the legislature. So right, the current house now, 435 voting members. Um, I think one of the ways we could have some reform in the Congress is to make it easier um, to get a piece of legislation to the floor and get voted on. One reason why we have more restrictions on uh, sort of getting legislation to the floor in the House is there's so many people, right? And so if you sort of, if every member of the House had floor access, uh, you'd, have, you'd have so many bills you try to pass, and there's ways you sort of trick that down a little bit. Um, but you know, we're worried about the Hastert rule, right? And that's partly a function of we need to control floor access so we can actually pass some legislation. Now I think that's been tightened down so much that we can't pass any legislation. Um, but, you know, to, to pick a number, I would say, look, you're going to have to worry about, you're going to double, you're going to have 700 or, you know, eight, 900 people in the House of Representatives. Uh, that's unworkable. Um, so, you know, I don't know, it's a, it's, it's a hard question. Yeah, I mean, on the flip side of New Hampshire, California has um, 120 people total in the legislature, uh, and the Senate is 40 members. There's 53 congressional districts in California. So the state senators actually represent more people than the members of Congress. Um, and, you know, is that good? I, I actually, I get asked this question every once in a while, and I've never, uh, it's to my shame that I've never looked at the evidence one way or the other. Because I think you can make arguments for bigger districts, you can make arguments for smaller districts. And so I'd love to see the evidence of what kind of benefit it, it actually makes on a variety of dimensions. I think it's basically, um, uh, an empirical question, you should look and see what the impact is, so. Okay. Um, so I think we, we did get Tom's answer to this question, I think, but, uh, but we want everyone to, to weigh in and certainly Tom to weigh in again. Um, we have two questions about partisanship versus nonpartisanship. Um, one asks, what could encourage other states to move to a nonpartisan system? Um, and the other says, um, Iowa is 40% nonpartisan, 30% Democrat, 30% Republican. So why should Democrats and Republicans get 100% of the seats? So are there ways to encourage no, either nonpartisan seats or nonpartisan redistricting in the states um, that might work? Iowa is not really 40% nonpartisan. <laughs> that's, the, that's the short answer. Um, lots of people that say they're neither a Democrat or Republican really are Democrats or Republicans. They just don't want to admit it. Um, and if not, well, then start a party, for heaven's sake, and quit messing around, you know, because um, <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, that's the answer, right? You can't, because uh, you still vote for Democrats or Republicans, and you look and act a lot like Democrat and Republican voters. And so, um, and that's true not just of Iowa. This is true of almost every state in America. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that most of them are Democrats and Republicans, so. Yeah, I, the, uh, um, 
the problem is that none of those people actually agree with each other on anything, right? <laughs> and so that's, that's separate from, uh, from the question of uh, independent um, redistricting and um, what could you do to encourage more of it? Um, I, well, that was the question, right? Yes, uh, So I think commissions are tough because you need to do them in basically in states. Either it has to be something that is a creature of the legislature. So that happened just recently in Ohio. They, they created a new redistricting commission that effectively is like a special committee of the legislature in a way. I mean, and plus the governor's on it and stuff like that. But, but it's not like it's, it's supposed to be separate from politics. It's just a way for them to resolve their differences. And it has some of the kinds of rules about how the districts ought to be drawn that, uh, that Tom has been talking about. And so in that sense, it's not that different than what um, Tom would be advocating, I, I think. I mean, no, that's um, true. So, uh, but then you also have the independent commissions. And I think to get those, you really need some kind of, um, either you have to have it imposed from above by Congress, that's not hugely likely, although there are bills floating around Congress, um, or you have to have it come up through a citizen initiative process, and not every state has those. Um, so I, I think to, to, or you could have the courts impose it as a solution, a permanent solution, but they have never shown any willingness to do something like that. So it's a solution, commissions, I think, could be part, of, we could see change in that direction, but it's not gonna probably be anything that every state adopts, an independent commission, like in California, for sure. All right, so our next question is something that Tim introduced in his discussion of the Shelby County case, uh, which is the idea that what the court really said was, okay, now you have to reconsider how race might count under the Voting Rights Act and what you might ask states to do to ensure fair racial representation and redistricting. Um, so wondering if the panelists could comment on what they think that might look like relative to the Shelby County case. Hmm. Actually, as I was reading through the case before uh, today's presentation, I was wondering that very thing, that I wasn't aware of, of particular proposals that have been floating around. I'm thinking, well, if the Supreme Court wants the, the uh, folks that are going to be drafting the uh, new version of the Voting Rights Act or a new section that was declared unconstitutional, what formulas exactly would they use? What problem do they see that's still in existence? And so I think that's where you, in some sense, have to start, is saying, well, what do we see is still the problem here? How do we craft a solution to address address that problem, because that's what they basically did originally in the Voting Rights Act, and again, extraordinary problem, extraordinary solution. Uh, do we still have that problem? Some would argue yes, some would argue no, and so that's the first, I suppose, a problem to overcome is to identify what the current situation is, and then, as they say, craft a solution to meet it. I'm going to answer the question by not answering the question, which is, <laughs> which is what I think the court did. Uh, so, you know, the, the court basically said, okay, this old coverage formula is bad. Congress, you, you guys just figure out a new one, you know, and pass a law, right? With the, with the clear expectations that there's no way Congress, <laughs> at least the current Congress, was going to get its act together and pass a law with an updated coverage formula. Uh, so coming up with one, I, like, we could write one down right now, probably about 10 minutes to come up with something, right? To get Congress to actually pass this piece of legislation, it's not going to happen. At least I think under the current Congress it won't. And it's important to remember that this is only for Section 5. So, so the, the two important sections in the voting rights sector, Section 2, which covers the entire country and is still in place and will stay in place until somebody overturns the law. And then Section 5 was this preclearance. And this was critically important in the 1960s when the South continued to update its methods of, of discriminating against black people. So if, if the Supreme Court struck down the poll tax, Alabama would come up with a new way, right, the next day. Right, okay, we can't have a poll tax, so we'll have a literacy test. And so that's what, this was the logic behind Section 5, was we need to get ahead of this, right, so they can't, because it would take two years to litigate it and strike down a literacy test. So it worked incredibly well, and it was very effective, and it was highly needed. I don't know if it's still needed today, um, but I, sure, I'd pass a, you know, some, new, some new standards and, and have it, because um, it, would, it would cover different states as well, right, if we came up with a, with a, th with a, with a new uh, method. But the, the Voting Rights Act is still in place, right? I mean, you can still, you can't discriminate on the basis of race and politics, um, because Section 2 is still there. So states, the southern, basically the southern states just don't have to pre-clear um, laws uh, when they when they pass them with the federal government. I'm being tacky and saying what time it is because I forgot my. Uh, phone 4:25. Number. 
Oh, sweet. We're doing great. All right. So we're going to make it through all of our questions. And apparently Mike came up with our new uh, next discourse symposium, which is what is wrong with Congress. Uh, so <laughs> we already have lots of questions for that one. Um, so we also blame Mike for this. Um, do you have a favorite district? If so, um, where and what kind of community does it favor? So I, I, you know, I said I like that one in California. That was an older district kind of thing. It exists anymore. It's only connected at high tide or low tide. Um, it was called it was called the Ribbon of Shame, yeah. uh, and it ran along the along the coast. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> what's your favorite, Eric? My my favorite district, um, the one that I like to cuddle up with at night. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, I, I really liked. I mean, I assume when you ask favorite district, the, the one that looks the weirdest when you look at it. Um, that, that's how I interpret that question. And by that, there was a district in North Carolina that was the, actually prompted the, um, uh, a key uh, Supreme Court decision in the 1990s about, um, about the Voting Rights Act. And it was, you know, it, it was trying to create a second um, majority minority district in North Carolina and it ran right along the, um, the highway. It's because, you know, there's, there's the, the uh, eastern part of the state is heavily African American and then the rest of the African American population is pretty geographically dispersed. They, they're in little pockets in different places in the state. And so in order to create that second district, um, they, they had to draw sort of all along the interstate to try and connect all these little pockets that ran up the interstate. Um, and it produced a, a very, very strange looking district. But, but again, like this is where the, the tension between a geographic based representation system and a representation system where we think other things are, are as important or maybe more important than geography starts to come into tension. So. There's another good one, which is, I had to look it up, uh, it's uh, Goofy Kicking Donald Duck, uh, and it's in Pennsylvania, and if we, we, we could put it up here, it really does look like that. <laughs> there, was, there was another one in Pennsylvania, I was involved in the, the 2000 redistricting there, and the, the then, the Democratic head of the, of the state house really had a way with words, he's a really interesting guy, now he's in prison. He's in prison, of course, because he's so interesting. But he, <laughs> he had, um, he named all of these things, and maybe even named this one, I don't know, but his, the favorite one that he had for me was uh, the sexually aroused supine seahorse. That's what he called, he called one of them. So I thought that was kind of nice. All right, can you top that, Tim? Huh. <laughs> nope, not even gonna try. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody asked me, but my favorite was always the Illinois, I think it's the fourth. Gutierrez district that the goes earmuffs. around right. Chicago like this, and it doesn't look contiguous on the map. It looks like chunks, but it must be some road connecting it all. It's not the tide. Uh, all right, so our next question is, how would a multi-party electorate influence redistricting? This is assuming we have one. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, how would they influence redistricting? Well, uh, um, I think it's probably more the other way around, that if you went to a different system of electing people, as Tom was saying, you would end up with more parties. Um, I think the current system we have encourages two parties. It sort of steers things in that direction. It's not the only reason why we have two such dominant parties, but I think it's an important part of it. Um, and so it probably, uh, and, and the people who call themselves independent, um, at least you know, in all, all the um, evidence of, that political science has uh, suggests these people are, are very divergent in their opinions. Um, they can be just as divergent as the partisans themselves in some cases. So it's, it's not like that's a cohesive block of people. And that's why these efforts to um, create some kind of third party movement that, that percolate up every so often don't generally go anywhere because you, there, there isn't a movement there, right? There's no kind of coherence. And so you need that as a, you need to see more evidence of that coherence in, in, in an independent movement or a third party movement before they would then be influencing uh, the way that redistricting is done. I would say we, we have experimented uh, with not necessarily always having single member districts. So over the time they've had at large districts within the state. Uh, Alabama used that, actually, to make sure they elected white people. Um, it was sort of was a re reaction to something else. There's been, over the years, a few number of multi-member districts. Uh, actually, if you look back into the early 1800s, 
uh, Philadelphia was a multi-member district. And then over the years, a lot of states, you know, maybe they would gain a new, they would gain a new seat through redistricting, and rather than go through the process of redistricting, so let's just throw another at-large person up there and everyone can agree with that. Um, so we haven't always had the same single member uh, district process, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's just by statute. It is. Yeah, so they could, you know, you could do little tweaks. You know, going to sort of a proportional system would be a massive change, uh, but you know, there are sort of smaller things that we could do just by statute change. Although I suppose at this point you couldn't have, you know, they would often overlay one at-large district over the top of all the other districts in a state when they just couldn't figure out how to, res I mean, every, this is the kind of thing that used to happen before a series of important Supreme Court decisions in the 60s um, that said that all districts had to be, uh, Mike talked about this in his presentation, that all districts had to be equal in population. It used to be sometimes they just, the legislature just couldn't agree on, an, on how to, they'd get a new district and they, um, in reapportionment, and they'd be like, I don't know what to do with this. So they just slap it on top of the whole state. Um, and that's, that, you can't do that anymore right. because the population would be different um, in the at-large district versus the others. All right, so our last question uh, goes back to the Voting Rights Act, but takes a little different turn. Uh, but can, we were wondering, can you comment on the, uh, I believe Alabama's closing of voter registration offices uh, that has happened recently? Or have we stumped you? <laughs> Well, I mean, Section 5 doesn't <laughs> exist anymore. Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, I think it's a sign that it probably would be a good thing if Congress had that conversation about revising the, the Voting Rights Act. Um, uh, there is actually a provision in the Act where you can opt in a jurisdiction um, if you have enough evidence of racial discrimination, and there's some people, some activists who've been talking about trying to pursue that um, approach aggressively. Um, there are actually two, in, like California has, like LA County and Alameda County are still covered under the voting, they have to pre-clear under the Voting Rights Act, but, but they, they opted themselves in. So they said, you know, we want to be part of the Voting Rights Act, so please make us part of the Voting Rights Act. One, I think it was, uh, no, go ahead, Tim. I was just going to say one of the things that the dissenters in Shelby County versus Holder talked about was they said that, look, the, the formulas that we have in place, the, the Voting Rights Act itself, that they allowed this progress that, to occur. And their concern was that if you remove the preclearance requirement that perhaps the, the states would begin to discriminate against and again. And so maybe that's what's behind the closing of voter registration stations, especially if they're taking place in certain areas more heavily populated by minorities, something of that nature. The fact that the, the state didn't have to pre-clear that kind of thing simply means that if they do and somebody wants to bring suit, they still can. Of course, that puts the burden then on somebody else to prove that the state is doing what it did to have either discriminatory purpose or discriminatory effect, which can take time and a lot of money. But these days, probably you have a greater chance for somebody to be able to fund that type of litigation. But again, that still could take several years before it would work its way up to potentially the Supreme Court. Uh, but if it does happen, if that type of thing does happen, then it would provide additional justification if somebody wanted to reintroduce the pre-clearance requirements if they see that type of regression occurring. And I, don't, I think it was Alabama or what a neighboring state admitted that they hadn't been complying with the motor voter law that was passed in 1993, which required them to put uh, registration materials in the DMV. Um, so. Um, I mean, you know, do states ignore laws? You know, everybody ignores laws um, here and there. Um, but and this, this isn't good. I think that it's, it's terrible to do. And it, it, even worse, it's not going to have an impact. Um, you know, legislators are risk averse, and they're always worried. Republicans don't want to increase turnout because they think it's going to hurt them. Democrats want to increase turnout because they think it's going to help them. But even a 10% increase in turnout would have almost no effect. And motor voter increased registration by 10% and an increased turnout by 0%. So anytime we have things like this, right, it, they, the, the, they're, they are worried because they want to keep their jobs, which, which is good. But all the voter ID, it doesn't matter. Either way, you know, it, it's not going to impact the, the, uh, the, the election outcomes. And so sometimes they get, they get a little too excited about some of the stuff, I think. I also think it may be a little harder, paradoxically, in, under the, in modern politics to prove uh, a racial motivation for 
any change that you might make because it, back when these um, when the Voting Rights Act was first passed, um, race and party were um, were pretty orthogonal to each other. They were not really, really I mean, there were a lot of people um, uh, in in both parties. Uh, a lot of um, uh, especially in the South, there wasn't, there were a lot of Democrats in the South. Um, that's not really true anymore. And, um, uh, sorry, a lot of white Democrats in the South. Um, and now there's a real racial dimension to partisanship in the South. And that makes it easy to sort of say, well, you know, the change I'm making is really about partisanship and not about race. And it's hard to, to, to prove that counterfactual. Pete, did you have anything you wanted to say before we adjourned? Yes, well first let's thank our final panel here because they did a nice job. The uh, scope of state knowledge is pretty impressive. <laughs>